Good morning, I'm Gail Hayes with the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And in our 2011 Kids Count report, we reported that one in five children in the South live in poverty. One in five children live in poverty. And in five states, that increases to one in four children. So armed with that compelling data, the program committee uh, for this year's annual conference designed an entirely new program track called Pathways to Prosperity, which were highlighting strategies that actually move kids out of poverty. And I want to mention some of those. I want to promote them. There'll be one on workforce development, one on health care, one on education, one on advocacy, and one on um, housing. So I really encourage you to attend these. They're going to be great sessions. And when we actually decided to do this track, we sought an expert that could frame the important issues and talk with us about the strategies that work. And Rod Haskins was the top recommendation by everybody we talked to. Uh, Ron is a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution and a senior consultant to the Casey Foundation. Uh, Ron has an important connection to the Southeast. He was educated at that very fine ACC University in Chapel Hill, where he under undergraduate, master's, and PhD. Ron is one of the nation's leading experts in welfare policy. And in 2009, he wrote a book called Creating an Opportunity Society, which has really become kind of the national uh, go-to text and has really received widespread acclaim. Ron asked me to do one thing in terms of introducing. He wanted you to know that he's a proud father of four children. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Ron with us today to talk about pathways um, out of poverty to prosperity. Let's welcome Ron. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. It usually takes me five minutes or so to overcome a fine introduction like that, so uh, I'm going to do my best. Um, when I was uh, back giving my PowerPoint to people in the back of the room, the person asked me if I'd like to have a, uh, uh, a mic, you know, that you put on yourself and you can walk all around, around and regale the audience and run up be confined to the podium. And I said, no, no, I, I'd much prefer to stay at the podium because usually I have to duck at some point during the presentation. But this podium does not provide much protection. The one before was the one I had in mind. Well, um, all right, so let's see. Uh, the hardest part of a presentation for me is pushing the right buttons. So let's see if I can actually do this. Um, my mother, God bless her, uh, told me when I was very young, when you give a talk, tell people what you're going to say, then say it, then tell them what they said. And of course, like all of you, I always do what my mother said, so I adopted this habit. And so here is what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to talk first about trends in poverty. Uh, then I'm going to talk about, um, maybe I'll look this way because I, can, I can't see that far away. Uh, government spending on means tested programs, which I think will be quite surprising to people in this audience. Uh, and then I want to talk about pathways out of prosperity. In particular, I want to talk about four of them some of which might be a little controversial, and I hope people who are asking questions will be aggressive and uh, point out the flaws of my, of my way. So now here goes the first test, can I? Yes, look at that, okay. Uh, first of all, just to provide you with an overview, um, uh, Gail mentioned that 20% of children are in poverty. Here are data going all the way back to the 70s on the progress that we have made against poverty. And when I show you the data on government spending in a few minutes, these numbers will be even more shocking than they are now. Uh, the blue line is all children, and as you can see, we're well above uh, where we were when we essentially started having federal government programs and greatly increased uh, state programs. Uh, so we have made essentially no progress with all children. There are some exceptions. I'm going to talk to you about the most important one of those in just a minute. Um, and then there are black kids. You see we have this very nice roughly in the mid-90s, a very nice decline in poverty among black children, and there's a very good explanation for that, which is directly relevant to people in this audience. I'm going to talk to you about that. And then I show the elderly at the bottom, where we have continuously made progress. And in fact, if I took that, that uh, bottom line back another 10 years, it would be close to 40%. So we have made dramatic progress against poverty among the elders, which makes me tell you two things. First of all, 
We did it in a very sophisticated way. We gave them money. <laughs> so I want you to write this down and remember it. If you give people more money and you give them enough, they won't be in poverty. So that would be one way to do it. Unfortunately, Americans don't like giving people money unless they deserve it because they paid into a fund like we did with Social Security uh, or that we're supplementing income that they make through their own efforts in employment, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So we made a lot of progress against the elderly, uh, in favor of the elderly. And the second thing I want to point out to you, and this is not necessarily a popular thing, we spend way more on the elder, elderly than we do on children, and it's increasing at a rapid rate, the difference between our spending on elderly and on children. Now I look at this audience and I see a lot of you um, might be elderly, uh, and I ask you to look at my hair. I'm elderly, I'm eligible for Social Security, so I'm speaking against my own self-interest. This is a huge public policy mistake in the United States that has to be corrected, especially given all right, good. A couple of young people here uh, applauding me. Uh, so we have to do something about this. We're also going bankrupt, or we already are bankrupt, but we can borrow money from the Chinese and uh, Saudis and other wonderful friends of ours uh, to keep going. And the biggest reason is the elderly and especially Medicare, which applies to more than just the elderly, but the big increases are among the elderly. So we simply have to do something about this because we are now running out of money. We're running out of money. We are spending less in many cases on children. I'll tell you some examples of this in just a few minutes. So the elderly is a good story from the perspective of it shows you we can make progress against poverty, and it's almost 100% because of Social Security. So government did it. But it's, it raises some issues about our priorities and our values as a nation. Uh, here is something that I, I, I want to make two points. This is a distribution of income, so for those of you who may not be familiar with this sort of thing, it's the very bottom quintile, so it's the bottom fifth of uh, people, uh, households in the United States, and the second fifth and so forth, all the way up to the top fifth, that's the next to the last set of bar graphs, and the top 1%. This is a famous 1% that played a role in the presidential election. And the blue bar is 1979, the red bar is 2007. The first point I want to make to you, and you will never get this if you read the New York Times and probably the Atlanta Constitution, every group has done better since the 1970s, every group. That's primarily because of government. It's not because they're earning more or they're more employed. I'll show you this in just a minute. But they're doing better primarily because of government transfers at the bottom. But we, that's the first point. So don't believe this stuff about people are not doing better. They are doing better. And this is through 2007. Now all bets are off after the, after the great uh, recession. I don't know what the long-term effects of that's going to be, neither is anybody else. I'm very concerned about it like you are. But through 2007, in more or less normal times, every group did better. And the second thing is that we, it is true that we have increased in inequality in the United States. It is primarily because, for whatever reason, everybody has theories, a huge amount of the increase in America's productivity, which has been great in recent years, goes to the top. I don't know exactly why that is, but that's a problem. And we already have, you'd never read this in the New York Times either, one of the most progressive income tax systems in the world. The top 20% of taxpayers pay over 80% of income taxes. The bottom half, as Romney famously said that 47%, actually it's 46%, pay no federal income taxes. And he left out a most important thing, which is many of them, maybe a little less than half, actually get money back. The government sends them a negative tax. And sometimes those checks are for $7,000. It's called the Earned Income Tax Credit and also the Child Tax Credit. So our tax system is extremely progressive. I am not saying we shouldn't tax people at the top more, but I just think in terms of a fair public debate, we already have a very progressive income tax system. That's not true of the way we finance Social Security and Medicare, but it is of our income tax system. Um, so now, we confront the question. We're, as I'll show you in just a minute, we spend a lot of money. We have great foundations in the United States that are out there in the communities working like mad. 
We're doing so much as a society, and yet we are making very little progress against poverty, and we do not have great opportunity for people from the bottom uh, in the United States. So why is that? And I'm going to answer that question. I know these are all factors. I don't know exactly how to order them. You all will have your own opinions, but I hope that you will wind up agreeing with me that these are all important factors. And for people who want to do something about it, you ought to look at all these factors, and one in particular that I think is badly neglected. So work rates are going in the wrong directions. Wages at the bottom are a big problem. Family composition is a huge problem. Education is a problem. And then a bunch of other things that I'm not going to talk about, except to say that if we could get a good immigration bill, I think I've calculated this as kind of back of the envelope stuff. I wouldn't necessarily defend this. Uh, but we could reduce our poverty rate by at least a half a percentage point if we had better immigration policy. Many countries in the world, including our neighbors to the north and Australia and other countries as well, they admit people based on education and experience. What an idea. So they're much less likely to be in poverty than many of the immigrants to the United States. And not only that, even more important, they're much more likely to contribute to society and create companies, make inventions, and so forth. And it's really amazing how many of our companies and the technological change in the United States are based on things that immigrants to the United States have done. And we could have many more highly qualified immigrants if we would perfect our policy. Instead, we admit a lot of people who live in poverty. Their kids are going to do a little bit better. We know that. Uh, but they're still, we still have big problems with immigration policy. All right. So last background point, government spending. Now, this, these are all official data from the Congressional Budget Office or from the Office of Management and Budget or from the Congressional Research Services, untouched by any biased fingers, including these 10. Uh, so I, these are truthful figures, all right? We have increased our spending on means-tested programs. That means poverty is a little misleading because not everybody's in poverty that benefits from these programs. But you have to be below an income criterion in order to get the benefits, OK? This is roughly speaking 86 or so programs or a couple of hundred little teeny ones that don't really make any difference. Uh, but there are 86 major programs. And about 15 of those spend a billion dollars or more a year. So you can see every year increases, increases. There have been a few times when we have not increased spending, like right here. But almost every year it's going up. And then we see this, this is the total spending. And this is per person in poverty, because total spending can sometimes be misleading, because the population is growing. And some years we have a lot more people in poverty than other years. So this just divides the spending by the people in poverty, as you can see, it goes up and up and up and up. Um, so no matter how you measure it, the government is spending a lot of money. Now, this is an occasion to tell you this is going to stop. It has already stopped to some extent, especially at the state level. This reflects only federal dollars. If you include federal dollars and state dollars, we are spending at least $1 trillion a year on these means-tested programs. So it's not like government doesn't have a firm commitment. Maybe government could do more, but that's unlikely in the next decade because of our deficit problem. I don't think government will spend more money if you account for inflation, but government could spend it a lot better, and I'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes. And then here's the spending uh, by category, and there's a very important point here. As you can see, it, by far the greatest spending is on health. Now, these are only the means-tested programs. This is also true of all government programs, but more spending on health than anything else. And as you can see, it goes down there all the way to employment, which is the least, the smallest of these eight categories. I think that is a big mistake. I'm going to come back to that uh, in a few minutes. But that gives you an idea of the spending. OK, so let's talk about the pathways. First, as everybody would agree, education. And I want to show you one of the most astounding. I've been, I'm kind of old. Uh, I've been working with tables and figures and data from uh, more, almost all my adult life. Uh, and this is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. This is, edu this is family income based on the education of the family head. Uh, and this is less than high school. This is high school. This is some college. This is a four-year degree. And this is above a four-year degree. Notice how they're all bunched down here in the past. Not a huge difference. Now look at this. Huge differences. And 
the lines never touch. They never touch each other. Education has always been so fundamental to income in the United States. In fact, that's one of the reasons we're such a great nation is because for many, many years, we defeated the rest of the world straight up on public education and on university education. I think we could still build a case that we do in university education, but as I'm about to show you, that's no longer true in public education. So education is really critical. Many of your foundations, I'm sure, focus on education like a laser. That's a smart thing to do. Uh, I'm gonna talk more specifically about that in a minute. Now, this is kind of complicated, but I just it has two messages I think are really vital uh, to people that are in our business. Um, let's just concentrate on this. And I know I'm not gonna be able to convince any of you that you can actually just love some data. It's just so amazing. That's what this is. This is, this is based on the panel study of income dynamics. Started following uh, 5,000 families back in the 60s and then followed their kids. So what this data does is compare actual parents back in starting in the 60s with their children both roughly in their maximum earning ages in the late 30s and early 40s, okay? So the parent's income and how does it relate to the child's income? And across the bottom here, we have the quintiles like we had before. This is the poorest, roughly speaking, today under around $20,000 a year, all the way to the top quintile, roughly speaking, over $100,000. And this is the parents on the bottom. And then the height of these bar graphs within these bar graphs, within the high bar graph, is well, how the kids are doing. So I can show you very quickly. Look at this bottom here. The, the red ones are without a college education, the blue ones are the ones that got a college education. So without a college education, people from the bottom 20% when they grow up, their parents were in the bottom 20%, under 20,000 today, when they grow up, the probability that they will be in the bottom 20% of income is 47%, more than double. The deck is stacked. You better choose your parents carefully <laughs> because it has a huge impact. Now, this is where a number of the stories stop. See how unfair we are as a society and so forth. Now let's look at the same kids, bottom 20%, if they go to college and get a four-year degree. Dramatically reduces the probability that they will be in the bottom. All the way down here, is that a 10? I can't see it. 10%, from 47% to 10%. How many of you are running programs that you can reduce a problem by more than four-fifths? That is an astounding outcome. It's done primarily in the private sector. There's a lot of money. By the way, we've spent about $250 billion between uh, scholarships and grants and loans, government and private, much of it to low-income families. So kids who are from a low-income family have a great chance of going to college if they can make the grades because we have so much support. $250 billion, a lot of money. So if they can get a degree, and then look at the top. This is a 3%, if, if we don't do anything, if they don't go to college, 3% chance that they'll make it to the top. But if they do go to college, it's, what is that? 10. So more than triple the chances that you'll make it all the way to the top. Education is really, really crucial. Now, how are we doing? Here's the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This is a carpenter's dream. It's as flat as it can be. <laughs> we are making no progress. And during this period, we have doubled per capita spending on education. So if somebody comes along and tells you money's the key, I am, there's room to doubt that. You certainly can spend a lot of money. No, foundations have never discovered this. You can spend a lot of money and not achieve anything because I know all you achieve all your goals. But it's possible to spend a lot of money and not achieve anything. And we appear to be doing that in public ed education in the United States. And not only that, but here are international comparisons. PISA, which is supposedly the best international comparison. Out of 64 countries, U.S. tied for 24th in mathematics tied for 19th in science, tied for 10th in reading, but they're very, very prominent countries that are beating us like the Slovak Republic. <laughs> Their kids are doing better than our kids. And Estonia, a world power for sure. Iceland, both of them from Iceland are doing better than our kids. You know? so, honestly, I, you know, I should, probably shouldn't joke about this, but it's pitiful. 
It is pitiful. We are just doing poorly, and we're, and we're outspending every single one of those countries. So to think that we're not spending enough money, I'm not saying that we shouldn't spend more, but money, it goes way beyond money. So education, we're not doing very well. So what should we do about it? And here I think there are many areas of investment. I personally favor preschool because I've been doing research on preschool all my life, uh, all my adult life. I think preschool does make a tremendous difference. I think we have very solid data. I'm probably preaching to the choir. I think all you might agree with that. But do you know that in the last two years, we have substantially reduced spending at the state level on preschool programs? And we're doing it this year, again, with federal dollars because of the money that we put in the so-called stimulus bill that has now run out. So I think the single best thing we can do to address the education issue is high quality preschool. How much time do I have? 20 minutes, okay, good. I'm sorry, y'all. You have to put up with me for another 20 minutes. Uh, if you're lucky, I'll finish 30 seconds early, okay? Um, and yet, we're reducing our spending. How can this be? Why would we do that? And especially not to pick on the elderly, as spending continues to skyrocket on spending on the elderly. And here's something else, too. This might be a little boring to you, but it's on automatic pilot. Congress does not vote on spending on the elderly. We did that years ago. Everything is on automatic pilot. It never comes before the Congress and says, how much should we spend on the elderly this year? It just keeps going. These are called entitlement programs. People that meet certain qualifications, they get the benefit. They get it automatically. It just keeps going. There's no budget. Imagine running your foundation with no budget. That's the way we do it. And yet we're cutting spending on preschool programs. If the sequestration passes, we will spend less money on Head Start. In fact, the National Head Start Association estimates that roughly uh, 50,000 kids will lose Head Start. So this is an ugly picture. The public should be going completely berserk over this. We should tell our politicians we Cut whatever you want to, but don't cut preschool programs and don't cut education. Um, K-12, I can tell you, I was in the Bush administration. That means I am not a Democrat. But I want you to know that I think this administration, Bush did a lot on education, but this administration is the best administration we've ever had on education. The innovation and above all, yeah, I probably shouldn't talk about this, but the president has shown from the time he was in the Senate that he was willing to tackle teachers' unions. And he has passed policies, enacted policies, that have really forced the teachers' unions to agree to probably, I think the most important thing in K-12 through education, I think almost everybody agrees, good teachers. And one of the most important things with good teachers is to base their evaluation on their performance, which means tests of school kids. Did they learn? Did they learn more? And this is now sweeping the country, and many states had laws that you could not do that. You could not base teacher pay or tenure on the performance of their students. And they had to change their laws in order to qualify for something called race to the top. I think that was a huge step. And as you all know, in this past election, is no exception. The teachers' unions and unions in general are a huge part of the Democratic coalition. So here you have the president from the very beginning challenging Challenging, this is like Republicans challenging the National Federation of Independent Business or the Chamber of Commerce. So it's a great achievement. I think we're on a path that we might even improve K-12 education over, say, the next 10 years if we continue the path that we're on. If we get better teachers, definitely kids will learn more. They'll be more likely to go to college and so forth. So the minister, we're doing more on education now than we've ever done, even though the Bush administration did a lot as well. And then post-secondary, I won't hardly have anything to say about post-secondary. I would like to make one point. We all know, and I've shown you, you get a four-year degree, it ch changes your whole life. And here's the really interesting part. The further down you are, the less money your parents make, the more it changes your life. So post-secondary is really crucial. But I want to make a little different point about post-secondary. We normally, normally think about universities and four-year colleges. Community colleges, it would be impossible to exaggerate the role that they should play if we really are going to boost the middle class and boost the income of people in the middle class. Last year I had the opportunity to give two talks 
one in North Carolina and one in Wisconsin as part of conferences on education and employment. And this is somewhat of a coincidence, but at there were lots of business people there. And at both of those conferences, the people from business said, we need welders. We need welders. We have jobs for $45,000 a year with benefits if we could find welders. And one guy said, we have several companies who are turning away business because they can't find welders. I recently read we have something like 800,000 skilled positions in the United States that are going, that are unfilled at a time when we have almost 8% unemployment. Community colleges are the key to this dimension, I think. And they are moving in the right direction. They need to move faster. And we need lots of programs, call them second chance programs. I'll show you one in a few minutes that really makes a big difference. To give kids skills that are marketable in the local economy. That's the key in the local economy. If we could do that, it would have a huge impact on income and the middle distribution. And that's where we really need to focus our attention. So all levels of education, preschool, K-12, post-secondary are very influential. I can't see that. What does it say? Five minutes? You just told me 20. Good data. Good data is really important. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to have to deprive you of all kinds of information because I had bad information myself. Okay, family composition. I really want to emphasize this because for some reason we're reluctant to talk about it and foundations won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Well, I'm trying to build a 12-foot pole that I'd like you to use it to touch family composition because this is a key to what's wrong in America. The percentage of our kids growing every year who are reared in single parent families. Now, I was a single parent with two young kids for five years. So I have a personal interest here, but I'm just telling you, if you look at the data, first of all, they are, let me just go back here for a minute if I can figure out how to do that. God, am I skilled or what? I can go backwards and forwards. So here's a percentage of kids that are born to unmarried parents. This is the most likely to be in poverty and the most likely to have problems when they grow up. Here are the percentage of our kids who are reared only with mothers. It's all, a quarter of our kids at any one time during the course of their childhood, maybe 40%, maybe more, are reared in a female-headed family. I do not have a brief against female-headed families. When I worked in the White House, we used to work on uh, the president's speeches, and he would always say, single parents are heroes. Many of them do a great job, but the facts are the facts. The kids are at a disadvantage and I'll show you that in just a minute. Here's the biggest disadvantage, poverty. The bottom line, kids in married couple families have less than a 9% chance of being poor, some years less than that. Kids in female-headed families or single-parent families have a 40% chance. Almost every year, they're five times as likely to be poor. And we now have a huge research literature that shows that kids from female-headed families and single-parent families are more likely to commit a crime they're more likely to drop out of school. They're more likely to be on welfare. When they grow up, they're less likely to have a job. They're less likely to go to college. If they go to college, they're more likely to drop out and so forth. So this is a huge area that we're reluctant to talk about. And this is one of the areas where I was worried about whether I could duck when somebody throws something at me. Uh, but it's a really important issue. We know a lot about how to reduce non-marital births and unintended pregnancies. We could. We need to spend these dollars. That was one of the most distressing things, especially for me, the presidential campaign is Republicans wanted to reduce this spending. Um, it's tied up with the abortion issue, which you, you need a 20-foot pole to touch that one. Uh, but we need to keep these separate. If people want to control their fertility, we should help them. And it should be free, especially for low-income mothers. We have all kinds of good studies showing that they want to use birth control, that they will use birth control, that it will reduce the number of births, and that we save way more money if we do that voluntarily than if they have babies outside marriage. So that's a very, very important thing. We should also encourage marriage, since I, I think she knew I was going to talk about uh, family composition, so she misled me on the time, so I couldn't talk about it as long. I'll be the, we've done a lot on marriage. And guess what the result is? We don't know anything. We do not know how to promote marriage. It's probably questionable for government to do it. The way the Bush administration did it was give money to local organizations and they tried to convince people, especially people who had already had babies, that it would be good for the kids if they got married. Um, they weren't very successful. 
So I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you you should be alert to this problem. And if anybody could figure out a way to get people to marry, especially when they've had a baby together, it would be a huge advance for the country. Um, okay, now I'm aware of my problem here, which is I probably have about two minutes. Okay, I want to say something about work because this is probably the mo everybody agrees with this. We're not making the progress we should. Look, it is really amazing. If you look at these are, uh, I want to first talk about, I don't have all men on this because I thought it would be too complicated, but if I did, it would go like this. There's a long-term decline in work among men. Nobody understands it. It's also true in Europe, but it's having a profound effect on family income because fewer men are working every year. Fortunately, women work more. It's actually tailed off a little bit. And here are never married mothers. This is the single most disadvantaged group in the country. And look at what's happened. It's associated primarily with welfare reform, but it shows that public policy and private policy and foundations can play a big role in encouraging low-income mothers to work. And one of the results has been, look at this decline in poverty. I showed you this before, but look at this. This is black kids and kids in female-headed families. These are the group most likely to be poor, as I showed you before. And because their mothers worked, it dramatically changed the probability they'd be in poverty. And Americans love that. Welfare reform essentially took the complaints about single mothers. You remember Reagan used to talk about welfare queens and so forth. It's pretty much off the table now because so many of these mothers went to work. 40% increase over a four-year period in the percentage of never married mothers who actually worked. And it was because of welfare reform and because government spent a lot of those dollars I showed you on something that I call work support. Their income tax credit, food stamps, child care to help low-income mothers get in the labor force and stay in the labor force and not have to spend their earnings on child care, and they still qualify for food stamps. The kids are still covered by Medicaid. So we really changed the whole system. Government benefits and played a big role, and that's why if you just look at government benefits and how much we've spent, as people often tend to do, that's very misleading. If you're spending a lot of money on food stamps for moms who earn $10,000, $11,000, $12,000 a year, and through public benefits, we get them to $20,000 a year where they're well above poverty. That is an investment. We should do that. So when someone comes along and puts all the food stamp money together and says, see, look at all this money we're wasting on welfare. That's very misleading. So don't be misled by that. It takes both a demanding society that requires people to work, insists on their working, does not accept excuses, and then helps them when they work because we know that in the foreseeable future, until our education and other programs start having impacts, we are not going to be able to have, you know, suddenly wipe out low income among these women. They're going to make 10, 11, 12, 13 thousand dollars a year. You want them to live on that if they have two kids? No. It's bad public policy. We can supplement their income. Americans support it because they're working, and that is a crucial thing that we need to learn to do. So this is another area where we can invest. Now I have less than one minute, two minutes. Oh, wow. Sexual employment, this is a great thing. I suggest if you want to make investments, sexual employment, and here's why, it's, I, in fact, let me just show you right here real quickly. These are actual data from three very good programs. The idea of sexual employment is that you focus on a certain sector of the local economy and give people the skills they need to enter that sector, okay? And here's what actually happens when you do that. This is a very good study, random assignment, all good hallmarks of science and so forth. And here's the, here's the experimental group. See, they learn less. Why? They're in the program. They're training. They're getting their skills compared to the control group. But look what happens. They make more money. They work more. They can support a family. So sexual employment, and here's the key to it. It has to be a program that not only gives them training, it has to give them training in something available in the local economy. There has to be a pathway from the training into the employment, so there's got to be a relationship with the potential employees, and it's got to be in an occupation where people can make more than 12,000. They can make 20 or 25 or 30, or in the case of welding, $40,000 a year. It could change their whole life. It could change the future for their children. So this is really a profound area, and especially if you can bring community colleges into it and they learn to do the training. This would be a great thing. Why? Because community colleges or institutions are going to be here forever. If they acquire these skills and get the people and the equipment they need to do this, then they can do it year after year after year after year. 
uh, community-based programs. So I was going to end with this, but I'm going to go right to, I'm going to talk about something new. This is another thing the administration has done. The administration, I don't have time to, you're lucky I don't have time to talk about this because I could talk for an hour before I, I'd be like I'm in the U.S. Senate. I'd talk for an hour before that's still on the introduction. Uh, <laughs> the administration has initiated six evidence-based programs that I think are going to have a profound effect on the effectiveness of our programs. I showed you all the money we spent. A lot of that is on allowancy programs that don't do anything. The administration is determined to use outcome data to direct their investments and to make sure that their investments are working and they would have a continuous flow of information. And one of these is a social intervention fund. Foundations have played a huge role here. I would tell you that basic community-based programs have not shown that they're effective. There are many more bad stories than there are good ones. It isn't clear that they produce the kind of effects that they could affect. And I think that the social intervention fund that the administration has started, it's only $100 million. But I think they're finding the best programs. It's almost like entrepreneurship. They're finding the best programs at the local level. They're investing in those best programs so they can expand. And they're testing to make sure that they're producing the results they intend. So this is, a, I think, a very important area. It should be important for foundations. There are organizations in your local economy that are probably doing a good job. And they're the ones that we should invest in. But we need to make sure that they're actually producing the outcomes. Evaluation is a critical part of this. So let me end with the, um, if I might go backwards, there. Um, this actually played a role in the presidential campaign. I was really fascinated about Rick Santorum. He was, uh, I bet Rick Santorum is very popular. I bet he has two votes in this room, maybe, maybe one. Uh, but Rick Santorum used it, and then Romney referred to it several times. This is what happens if you follow three really profound, difficult rules. Here's what they are. Graduate from high school. Get a job. Wait till you're 21 and get married before you have a baby. Very profound. If you do those three things, the probability that you'll be in poverty, as you can see at the bottom here, if you follow all three, is 2% in any given year. This is based on actual Census Bureau data. The probability you make the middle class roughly 55,000 above, 72%. If you violate all three rules, the probability you'll be in poverty in any, any given year is 77%. And if you... Uh, and the probability you make the middle class is 4%. So now I ask you, how important is individual responsibility and rearing kids and having them in programs and in public education and in families above all that teach these three really deep, profound, difficult messages way more important than any single government program? So the message for you at the local level and for the nation as a whole and for the states is that it takes a combination of wise government, investing its money wisely, we, we, we have plenty of money, and we're not investing it wisely. And then the second thing is individual initiative, individual responsibility, which comes primarily from families, from churches, from local communities. It takes all the above to produce the impacts we want. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Now I'm supposed to answer some questions and this gentleman right over here has the first question. And he promised me it'd be easy. Given the, given the disparity in uh, expenditures on children versus the elderly that you talked about earlier, um, we know that uh, so many entitlements are in, uh, spending is entrenched. There's a very powerful lobby for the elderly. There's not a very powerful lobby for children. How can Ch advocacy for children increase and how can we play a part in that? Okay, let me say three things. First, I think the children's, the children's cause in Washington and in many state capitals is much stronger than you might think. I have seen repeated examples where Congress did go out of their way to preserve spending on children and to create new programs. We've created a lot of new programs over the year. We still spend an increasing percentage of government uh, expenditures on children. We have very good studies. If anybody wants to know about it, send me an email. I'll send you a reference for the study. So we do, we're doing okay, but we should be doing much better. And there are two things that we need to do. There are two specific policies. One of them is health care and Medicare especially. Social Security is a problem. I'll come to that in just a second. 
but the big problem is Medicare because it increases so much and it's on automatic pilot, as I said. And one of the reasons, there are you know, lots of different opinions here. People yell at each other about this in Washington. I know this is shocking that people in Washington would ever yell at each other, but they actually do. They get really mad. They froth at the mouth. Uh, I'm, I'm serious. And I think the biggest problem is the market. There is no market in healthcare to speak of because third parties pay for almost everything, either through insurance or through Medicare or through Medicaid. People who make the payments and the doctors who get those payments have to feel the pressure of the market. If they don't, healthcare is going to continue to increase at a huge rate. Now, unless you think this is some kind of fairy tale, there's a fabulous article in the Atlantic about two years ago, three years ago, by a guy named Atul Gwande. And he compares, among other things that he does in this article, per person spending on Medicare in McAllen, Texas, and in El Paso, Texas. The difference in average spending in the same state, double, double. And he goes into the reasons why. There's no question that we know a lot about how to control health care expenditures, and we have to do that. One way is what Ryan proposed, uh, which is not very popular, but it's called premium support, and it brings the market much more into play. And a second way is the things that Obama put in Obamacare. By the way, some people think Obamacare is an insult. I noticed that the president told an interviewer recently that he likes the term Obamacare. So I say Obamacare. There are many provisions that are not the least of which is this board that Republicans call the death panel, which might be a slight exaggeration. But <laughs> this is a group of people who experts actually know some things occasionally, and they would propose, based on evidence, measures that would be, that would be included like the ones in El Paso that got their costs down, and that the whole country would have to do that. The Congress could override it, but it would enjoy the bill would enjoy special privilege and to a great extent would solve the problem that you're worried about, which is how do you, you know, how do you get these things to pass? And the answer is you give the legislation every possible advantage. It has to be voted on. It has to be voted on by a date certain. There can be no amendments and it just takes a simple majority so you avoid the problem uh, of, of the filibuster in the Senate. So that is, it's going to be hard to defeat the lobby of the elderly. Now, one more thing that I think is really important. I am not talking here about cutting Medicare expenditures. I'm talking about reducing the rate of growth. So we're going to spend more on Medicare, but we need to reduce the rate of growth. And the last thing is, one of the things we need to do, and I think we could do this, I think it would pass the Congress, and I think the AARP would, might go along with it, and that is we should reduce the reimbursement rates for people who are wealthy. That makes sense. Many of our policies are based on that premise. We could do that. There's a rumor going around, and this is a big deal in, among people who argue about social policy, that poverty programs are poor programs, and that means that if it's just for the poor, it'll get cut for sure. You need to have the middle class involved, and that, that was Roosevelt's insight in the way the Social Security was set up, and then Johnson did the same thing with Medicare. But it's not really true. There are lots of examples of programs that are more or less untouchable. The earned income tax credit has never really been cut. In fact, it's been expanded many, many times, including under Republican presidents. So I, I, do, I, would, I don't agree with that. I think we have to redu one of the ways we can control Medicare spending is by making it more market oriented. And the other way is by reimbursing less for people who are rich. We could set that up. We could pass it this year. I don't know why we don't do it. It's because of the dysfunction in Washington. Question two. Oh, that's it? See how smart I was? I only had to answer one question. It struck me as Dr. Haskins was talking that I have the greatest job. I get to give gifts to smart people who do all the work. I feel like Santa Claus. Thank so you. thank you for being with us. It was great. Thank you so much.